Uh, welcome, GHA Online users. Here we are with our second series of smart people we can learn from. And this is my close friend, Jeff Schnipper, uh, who's the director of clinical research at Brigham Women's Hospital. He's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and he's an academic hospitalist at Brigham Women's Hospital. Jeff, thanks for covering out the time. To Thank chat you with so us much together. for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So let's first start with transitions in care. Sure. And we are curious, why is this a persistent problem? Why are all of our delivery systems struggling with this? This is a very hard problem, and I wish I knew who to credit this analogy to, but, but the one I heard that's very effective is thinking about watching a football game from the nosebleed seats. Mm. And then it's halftime, and they put you down onto the field, and they hand you the football, and they say, okay, now you're the quarterback, go. Mm. And mm. you're completely unprepared mm. for that. Mm. And I think that's a lot of what happens in our hospitals. Mm. You have patients mm. who are very sick and complicated, very mm -hmm. often we are passive recipients mm -hmm. of the care that we receive in the mm -hmm. hospital. And then all of a sudden they mm -hmm. say, okay, you're not feeling well still because no one leaves the mm -hmm. hospital feeling super well. Mm -hmm. You need to rearrange 40% of your medication regimen. You need mm -hmm. to keep all of these follow-up appointments. Mm -hmm. You need to now know what it is that you need to watch out for to monitor your new health conditions. Mm -hmm. You need to do all these different healthcare behaviors, whether it's giving yourself shots, doing wound care, mm. dieting and exercising, knowing what to watch out for, knowing who to mm. call, mm. And, uh, and then we just send you on your way. And we mm. wonder why patients mm. don't always do that well afterwards, or we blame the patient afterwards, mm -hmm. when we're setting them up to fail. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true probably anywhere where we're having mm -hmm. these transitions of care uh, mm -hmm. from the hospital back mm -hmm. to the community. Mm -hmm. And what was the catalyst for you personally in thinking about the redesign from hospital-based care to ambulatory outpatient care? Sure. So I'm a hospitalist, so mm -hmm. I spend most of my time taking care of hospitalized patients who inherently belong to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about the information voltage drop mm -hmm. when a patient is admitted, uh, comes into the hospital and the care transfers from a primary care mm -hmm. physician to mm -hmm. a hospitalist and then back to that primary care mm -hmm. physician at discharge. And so I think a lot of us are very interested in systems that compensate, at least in part, for that mm -hmm. voltage drop. I think hospitalists mm -hmm. bring a lot of value to care, mm -hmm. otherwise I wouldn't be doing it, mm -hmm. but I think we need to mm -hmm. be very aware of that issue. So I think that's one of them. I think another is, I've done a number of studies mm -hmm. where we tried to do interventions to improve outcomes mm -hmm. after discharge, mm -hmm. but mostly from the hospital side, because that's the environment mm -hmm. I come from, the one I can control the most, mm -hmm. to the extent I can control anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were inherently limited, I think, mm -hmm. in how effective they could be. Mm -hmm. And it became clear to me, and I think to a lot of other people, that a good transition of care really requires efforts on both sides of the equation, mm -hmm. doing the parts that they're both good at and talking to each other and communicating really well. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of that, we see things going wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that, that's where all this started. Mm -hmm. I think the other uh, instigator for this was the emergence of accountable care organizations mm -hmm. in mm. the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of it grew out of, uh, of Obamacare, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. But it really was a, was a movement that was growing, this idea that you have a large, integrated care system that can really take responsibility mm. both morally, ethically, medically, and financially for the mm. care of that patient for the year. Mm -hmm. We need to take mm. care of them as well as possible, mm -hmm. spend as little money as possible, uh, but really provide high quality care and care that they care about. Mm -hmm. And so, so Partners became a pioneer ACO through this program. Mm. And so the question was, could Partners Healthcare really transform itself mm -hmm. to being all about population management? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of our primary care practices became patient-centered medical homes. Again, another bit of lingo, but this idea that these primary care practices really are invested in, in the whole patient's care mm -hmm. throughout any transition that takes place. Uh, and so, so both now the hospital and the primary care practice are, are motivated philosophically mm -hmm. and financially mm -hmm. to help these patients do well. And so this grant grew out of this idea of let's take full advantage of that mm -hmm. and see, again, if both sides can do the parts that they're really good at and communicate with each other mm -hmm. and, and help these patients do well mm -hmm. after, after discharge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now that we have motivation and money lined up, mm -hmm. what else do we need to make this systemic change? Sure. And, and it's not as much money as I would have thought. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> hospitals probably still ironically make money from readmissions. As many mm. penalties as we are subjected to, mm -hmm. we live in this fee-for-service system mm -hmm. where the, uh, the, the financial incentives are still misaligned. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we are being increasingly penalized, mm -hmm. I would say, for readmissions. Mm -hmm. And so, but hospitals at the same time are also feeling very squeezed financially. Mm -hmm. I think they see an environment mm -hmm. coming where they're gonna be seeing less and less of the pie. And so mm -hmm. it's still very hard to get them to 
mm -hmm. uh, put money into resources mm -hmm. where uh, and into services that are really going to improve these outcomes after discharge. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't quite have the money. We have the motivation. <laughs> we have some of the money. Mm -hmm. um, the next ingredient is really creating systems of care mm -hmm. built around mm -hmm. these transitions. And you know, mm -hmm. traditionally, in the United States at least, and I think in a lot of other places as well, we have a very fragmented healthcare system mm -hmm. where you have different providers working under different incentives with different information systems mm -hmm. uh, and uh, different systems in general. And mm -hmm. we need to create systems that are really much more holistic, that mm -hmm. are really patient-centered and really seamless to the patients. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, a, that's a huge piece of this. Mm -hmm. I think another piece of this is changing our orientation mm -hmm. from one of doing for patients to one where we're really coaching patients and their families mm -hmm. to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a big paradigm shift in, in mm -hmm. all of our training. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're all used to just providing patients with everything mm -hmm. um, rather than a little bit, I don't know if tough love is the right approach, mm -hmm. but coaching maybe is the best mm -hmm. analogy. Mm -hmm. We're really empowering patients mm -hmm. uh, and listening more to them what they want mm -hmm. and what really is important to them, for example, in the post-discharge recovery period. Mm -hmm. So I think those are, those are some mm -hmm. of what we still need mm -hmm. to work on. Mm -hmm. What are some of the hypotheses that you're actually testing with respect yeah. to informatics and team-based care? Sure. So we created a, uh, a conceptual model of the ideal transition of care. Mm -hmm. And um, it's got about 10 uh, structural components to it. Mm -hmm. And we drew the model as a bridge where each of mm -hmm. these components is, a, is a, uh, an upright in, in the mm -hmm. bridge. And mm -hmm. you know, I like the bridge analogy for, for a few mm -hmm. reasons. You know, obviously, it's a transition. Um, the more supports a bridge has, the stronger mm -hmm. that bridge mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. The more that are missing, the more wobbly it gets, mm -hmm. the more likely your car is going to drive into the river and the patient's <laughs> going to end up back in the hospital. Mm -hmm. The other reason mm -hmm. I like the, the analogy is that there's definitely things on the, on the hospital side of the bridge that's within our purview as, mm -hmm. as hospitals. Mm -hmm. Doing good discharge documentation and timely mm -hmm. discharge documentation, mm -hmm. setting up that discharge plan. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there are things on the community side mm -hmm. that are very much in the, under their purview doing these post-discharge mm -hmm. visits, for example. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of bunch of stuff in the middle mm -hmm. that I think is really both our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And it needs to start in the hospital. We need to communicate it well. And then mm -hmm. the primary care team and the ambulatory team in general needs mm -hmm. to take the ball and run with it. Mm -hmm. Things like medication safety, empowering mm -hmm. patients and their families, mm -hmm. setting up community and family uh, supports, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on, on palliative care and, and mm -hmm. end of life planning where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, all of these issues mm -hmm. um, are there. And so one of our hypotheses is that the more of these components you have, the stronger mm -hmm. your intervention is. Mm -hmm. And we'll know which ones every one of our patients gets in this study, mm -hmm. some of which we can directly control what they got and what they didn't, some of which is beyond our control, but at least we can see mm -hmm. what they received. And so we can ask questions like, are these three components the most important ones? Is that all that matters? Or mm -hmm. is it the breadth of components that really matters? Mm -hmm. um, there's no magic bullet for readmissions. I don't think we're under any fantasies that, oh, if you only do this one particular thing, mm -hmm. you will uh, have good outcomes. Mm -hmm. But I still don't think we have a great sense of which are the most important components, mm -hmm. or, or is it that you just have to do a lot of them? Or is it mm -hmm. the breadth of them in these different components mm -hmm. of, this, of the conceptual model? I think another thing that we're going to hypothesis test is which patients benefit the most. Mm -hmm. There are a lot mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, risk uh, scoring systems that are out there that try to predict who's most likely to have a bad post-discharge outcome, who's most likely to come back to the hospital. Mm -hmm. To me, that's not the most important question. To me, mm -hmm. the question is which patients are most likely to benefit from our interventions mm -hmm. because that's what we, we can control. There are mm -hmm. a lot of non-modifiable risk factors mm -hmm. that people have, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't give up caring for these patients. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we, we, are, we are bound to care for them, but if we're deciding who should be getting our, our services, we should be spending our resources most wisely mm -hmm. for those patients most likely to benefit. So that's another mm -hmm. piece of this mm -hmm. hypothesis mm -hmm. that we're going to test. Mm -hmm. So the other tension I know you think about a lot is we're trying to prevent readmission, and at the same time, we're being asked, as those practicing in the hospital day setting, to decrease length of stay. Right. So just to backtrack for our general uh, community here of GHG Online users, these seem in conflict. We're trying to say, do not readmit the patient to the hospital, but also make sure their length of stay is right. short. That's right. And, and um, partners and the Brigham in particular this year are, are working on this patient progression project, mm. which is a lot about 
Um, you know, you could call it bed turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not like we're trying to kick these patients out of the hospital as quickly as possible. It's that we're full. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the good fortune to be a, a, a popular hospital. Mm -hmm. um, we're worried about the next patient, the one who's still mm -hmm. in the emergency department who can't get upstairs because we have a patient in mm -hmm. a bed upstairs who really could have gone home a few hours ago or, or could have gone home yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so we want everyone to be in the hospital as long as they need to be in the hospital and no longer, mm -hmm. um, and then, then have the best outcomes afterwards. So to, to a first pass, you can argue that uh, these two things are in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. If we send a patient out early before we've done all the discharge education mm -hmm. we want to do, before we've dotted all our I's and crossed our T's in terms of setting up these services, they mm -hmm. are going to be at higher risk. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at, at just observational models, length of stay and readmission ri risk actually are positively correlated, and that's mm -hmm. just because they're both a marker of how sick a patient is. Mm -hmm. So the sicker you are, the mm -hmm. longer you're in the hospital, and the more your, your readmission mm -hmm. rate is. But we all know of cases where we've probably sent home a patient too soon, mm -hmm. and they've come back and had mm -hmm. a, a, a poor outcome. And no one is really giving us clear direction on which and we should mm. be working on the most. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, don't worry so much about length of stay. Make sure that they have a good post-discharge outcome or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Certainly ethically, morally, as a physician, that's where I'm going to err. Mm -hmm. um, but we are getting this pressure to have patients leave. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that to a certain degree, sometimes these two are actually completely synergistic with each other yeah. and completely in line with each other. If we can talk to patients and families very early in their hospitalization mm -hmm. about mm -hmm what the criteria are for discharge, mm -hmm. where they're going to be going, when they're going to be going, and prepare them for that discharge. What are going to be the mm -hmm. barriers to a safe discharge and can we anticipate them? And can we then address those issues? Then we will both get the patient out faster mm -hmm. and they will have a better outcome. Mm -hmm. And so that's why mm -hmm. doing things like this pre-discharge preparation checklist, mm -hmm. that is one of our key components of the intervention, is so important. Mm -hmm. If you can identify in hospital day two that the patient has no access to their medications or their family has mm -hmm. no idea that they're going to be coming home or what they're going to need mm -hmm. to do to care for them, mm -hmm. or they're going to be unable to keep their follow-up appointments, or they don't even have a telephone, and you can address these issues while they're still in the hospital, mm -hmm. that won't become the barrier to discharge mm -hmm. and they'll do better afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I talk to hospital administration, I work on that angle as much as I can, mm -hmm. knowing that the other issues still remain. Mm -hmm. um, and really, we've not been given enough direction sort of how mm -hmm. to deal with the conflicts. But mm -hmm. I think there's still enough in common that we can work mm -hmm. on the common ground first. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. You shared an important thread and something we'd love to hear about um, your involvement with the patient family advisory councils. Because as you're saying, in the individual patient, if we got their family involved early during the admission, we likely will have a safe and effective discharge. Yeah. But also on a population level or a hospital level, you know, how are the patient family advisory councils involved? How are patients being trained to serve on these advisory councils? And yeah. your thoughts would be? Yeah, I know it's been, it's been fantastic. So, so this uh, grant that I'm, that I'm talking about was funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, mm -hmm. which was also set up by Obamacare. It's a public-private mm -hmm. consortium. And um, by definition, you have to have a patient family advisory council involved in every mm -hmm. aspect of the study from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And I'd never done that before. Mm -hmm. and, and, and frankly, I was, I was hesitant and a little bit skeptical. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I certainly knew that patient involvement in these kinds of interventions mm -hmm. in theory would be a good idea, mm -hmm. but I had, hadn't done it before and I wasn't sure how much their involvement in other aspects of the research was really going mm -hmm. to matter if we were just paying lip service. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say it has been one of the best surprises that yeah. it's been fantastic. Yeah. Um, they are an inspiration, yeah. I think, to all the work that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I love going to those meetings every yeah. month. And um, some of their involvement has been you know, pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Every step of the intervention that touches patients should be vetted by a group of patients mm -hmm. and caregivers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they do. And they tell us what they like and what they don't like. And we've mm -hmm. made modifications to the interventions in response. Mm -hmm. um, another area, obviously, is if we're going to be doing patient surveys, we want to make mm -hmm. sure the patient survey is understandable to patients. Mm -hmm. So here you've got this instant focus group mm -hmm. of patients and families that you can work mm -hmm. with. Um, down the line, they're going to be mm -hmm. very involved in helping us interpret the results of our study and then figuring mm -hmm. out how do we explain the results to the public. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I definitely think that's a part that's been mm -hmm. missing from research, is really thinking about how do we get these messages across? Because you know what we find is going to have implications for the public, mm -hmm. but uh, we're not always the best communicators. We write in scientific journals, we talk to each other, we go to meetings, mm -hmm. but we're not always out there with, with patients and mm -hmm. with families talking about what the impact of our studies mean, and so that's another huge piece of it. But I have to say, even the other parts of the, of the research that they've been involved with has been just really valuable input. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are we asking the right questions mm -hmm. uh, in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, I think that's where a lot of research fails. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if the research is designed to show that, you know, drug A is better than nothing, 
that's good for the maker of drug A, but that's not mm. usually helpful when there's already drug B that's out there. And mm. so I think asking, uh, asking the right questions in the first place is that's the time to get, get families involved. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a couple examples of where mm -hmm. um, we've really learned a lot. Mm -hmm. So one of them gets back to your issue of, of caregiver involvement. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say strongly enough mm -hmm. how important that piece is and how clear mm -hmm. that message has been mm -hmm. from our PFAC and um, our Patient Family Advisory Council. And um, they should be viewed as members of the care team and a very mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. group, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, component. Because mm -hmm. when patients leave the hospital, it's the caregivers that are often the difference mm -hmm. between these patients doing well and not doing mm -hmm. well afterwards. And I think all too often, we view the family as, oh, this is just another phone call I need to make. This is more time I need to spend mm -hmm. at a meeting. Instead mm -hmm. of saying, you know, this is a really important part of the care team that we need mm -hmm. to empower before they leave. They are not just the ride home. They mm -hmm. are, you know, often the linchpin to these patients doing mm -hmm. well. And the caregivers keep telling us, you know, we need to be involved. You need to give us access to the medical information. We need mm -hmm. to have the discharge summary in our hands. You need to mm -hmm. include us uh, all along the way, uh, and especially at discharge, and they're mm -hmm. right. I think another uh, epiphany that I had working mm. with them mm. was this issue of how quick the follow-up appointment should be. Mm. So as providers, it's very natural for us to say, well, the sicker and the more complicated mm. the patient is, the faster they need to be seen mm. back in the office. I want to mm -hmm. see you within three days, mm -hmm. within four days, um, certainly within a week. Mm -hmm. What they tell us is the sicker and the more complicated they are, the less well they feel when they leave, and the less they want to come back right. for that follow-up appointment in three days. Mm -hmm. And they often don't keep it. Mm -hmm. And this has to be a, an upfront mm -hmm. negotiation. We will often talk to patients and say, are you aware that you have a follow-up appointment four days from now with your PCP? And they'll say yes. But how often do we say, are you going to keep that appointment? <laughs> Straight up. And they'll say no if you ask mm -hmm. them. I'm mm -hmm. going to feel lousy. I'm not going to want to come mm -hmm. to that appointment. Or my you know, caregiver has to work that day, and she mm -hmm. can't actually drive me. And mm -hmm. so. It's a, it's a willingness, it's an ability, mm -hmm. and it's a negotiation, mm -hmm. one patient at a time. And if the mm -hmm. patient is not willing to come back and keep that appointment in four days, don't make that appointment mm -hmm. in four days. Make it in two weeks. But if you're going to make it in two weeks, you've got to put the things in place to monitor that patient mm -hmm. and make sure that they are safe until that appointment mm -hmm. in the hospital, back mm -hmm. in the office. You know, whether that's phone calls, mm -hmm. home visits, telemedicine, whatever resources we need to bring to bear, that's what we need to do in, mm -hmm. under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a big epiphany for us. And there's a lot of pressure now uh, from Medicare on down. Mm -hmm. High-risk patient needs to be seen within one week. Moderate-risk mm -hmm. patient needs to be seen within two weeks. That's what our, our new billing codes tell us to do. Mm -hmm. When the answer is one size doesn't fit all, and it really mm -hmm. needs to be a negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think another big epiphany we had talking to them was um, patients often get admitted for subspecialty-oriented things. Mm -hmm. So they have a a hip replacement done, mm -hmm. or they see a neurologist for mm -hmm. something. And then the question is, so they're going to follow up with that specialist. Mm -hmm. Do they also need to follow up with their primary care physician? Mm -hmm. And um, what we've learned are a couple of things. Is One, the specialists aren't always focused on the same issues that I'm focused on and that I'm trying to get our primary mm -hmm. care practices focused on. Are you able to take your medications? Did you pick up mm -hmm. your prescriptions? Are you mm -hmm. aware of what you need to call for? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you know how you're going to get to all your follow-up appointments? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the orthopedist's office may not be asking those same questions. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not asking those questions, we need to be. And even if we didn't mm -hmm. schedule a follow-up appointment, if we find mm -hmm. out that something is concerning on that phone call, mm -hmm. then they need to come back and mm -hmm. see us so we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. The other is that whether or not they want to see the, the, the primary care physician as a matter of course mm -hmm. depends on the relationship between that patient and that PCP. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of members of our Patient Family Advisory Council who loud and clear say, you know what, I want everything to go through my PCP because I trust him. Mm -hmm. And even if I was there for a knee replacement, mm -hmm. uh, I want them to see me as well and mm -hmm. make sure that they're on the same page with the specialist, mm -hmm. on the same page as me, uh, that mm -hmm. we're sort of addressing you know, mm -hmm. my care needs holistically. Mm -hmm. Other people may not feel that way. If you have an isolated mm -hmm. subspecialty problem, maybe you don't. And so, again, I don't think one size fits all, mm -hmm. but I think we need to be aware of these issues. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so those are just you know, three examples, mm -hmm. I'd say, of where I, I mm -hmm. learned a lot mm -hmm. from having this, this group. And the, the final thing I want to say about patient family advisory councils mm -hmm. is just having them come to steering committee meetings mm -hmm makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't say a whole lot, mm -hmm. having a patient in the meeting with my chief medical officer and my chief nursing officer and the head of primary care um, sometimes changes the dynamic of the meeting because mm -hmm. we're all very vividly reminded of why we're there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is not about my turf, mm -hmm. your turf, politics, my bottom line. Mm -hmm. It's about these patients mm -hmm. 
these families. Mm. And um, it often makes the conversation a mm. lot more productive um, mm. just by them being there. And so mm. I think that's been a really mm. nice piece of it as well. Mm. So. Seems like a compass and the needle. Yes, let's Co change, yes. yes. Uh, versus let's obviously. change true north. Yeah, right. the yeah. politics and the money that are within any right. Um, right. health organization. Absolutely, and look, you know, we're all in the business because we want to help people, and, and but, uh, you know, way too often, I think the other issues do end up becoming mm -hmm. pretty pretty important. And, you mm -hmm. know, no organization can commit financial suicide mm -hmm. in doing these kinds of things. Yeah. But, you know, we are changing our payment system so that it's not. Mm -hmm. Now we need to, to move, mm -hmm. move true north mm -hmm. uh, in, in this direction. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really helped mm -hmm. do that. So, so Jeff, our users on ghdonline.org, there's about 13,000 from 180 countries. And many of them are practicing community-based care with community health workers and paraprofessionals are referring patients to district level hospitals right. and the rare tertiary hospital that may be within a 100 kilometer right. radius. And I was just curious, you had to think of the implications, right. the inverse of some of your research right. um, and what you would share with our community members. Right, you know, so I'm working a lot obviously now with primary care physicians mm -hmm. and, and with, with communities mm -hmm. around this and they really do have to be the linchpins. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they often feel like they would like to be, but they're not getting the resources and the information mm. that they need to do their job well. Mm. So they need to demand it of the hospitals where they're sending their patients. And if they're mm. not getting it, you know, they need to go somewhere else or, or demand mm. it from the places mm. they are getting. Um, when I think of the components of the intervention that we're providing, what are we doing on the hospital side? Well, you know, one thing we're doing is having a discharge advocate whose job mm. it is is to communicate mm. with the outpatient team. Mm. And they exchange information. You know, we know what's going on with the hospital in the hospital that moment, what's wrong mm -hmm. with the patient, where are they likely to go, when are they likely to go, what are going to be the issues. Mm -hmm. But the primary care team knows the patient. Mm -hmm. What have been the, the obstacles in the past to mm -hmm. a good transition of care? What's going on in their home life? What's their social support network like? Mm -hmm. um, and if they talk to each other, they'll come up with a better discharge plan mm -hmm. than if they're not talking mm -hmm. to each other. So um, what's the other big piece we're doing in the hospitals? We're doing good medication reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that I studied for, mm -hmm. for years and continue to study. Mm -hmm. um, we need to know in the hospital what the patient was really taking before they got admitted mm -hmm. and make sure that we actually are looking at that list mm -hmm. and what they're currently on when we write that discharge order. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so simple, but we do a terrible job of this. Mm -hmm. And um, if we don't send people home on the right medications, not even talking about sort of the medical decision making, this is mm -hmm. you know basic blocking and tackling. Mm -hmm. If we don't do this well, it's not gonna get caught immediately and it, mm -hmm. and it may not get caught for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that 65% of, of adverse events that occur within 30 days of discharge are adverse drug events. Mm -hmm. And so you, know, so, so you should be demanding good communication mm -hmm. and proper medication mm -hmm. management of your hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, and probably also the beginnings of these other components of the bridge that I talked mm -hmm. about. You know, mm -hmm. So are we identifying patients who really need end-of-life planning? Mm -hmm. Are we identifying patients who might need extra programs in place, mm -hmm. whatever they are for the outpatient setting? Mm -hmm. Are we setting them up with the appropriate follow-up within the appropriate amount of time? Mm -hmm. Are we doing good discharge documentation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are we doing those things? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we should be. And, you know, and another point that I've been making to our Patient Family Advisory Council, I think they brought it up themselves, is that I think patients themselves also have very low expectations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they also need to raise their expectations. Mm -hmm. They should be demanding this kind mm -hmm. of transitional care mm -hmm. um, when they are in a hospital, mm -hmm. um, and we should be stepping up and doing it. Mm -hmm. And then the communities really need to have the resources mm -hmm. to hold up their end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. So they need to be able to see the patients quickly, mm -hmm. ideally with their own provider. Mm -hmm. and that's always mm -hmm. hard, um, mm -hmm. but should be uh, achieved. You know, they should be uh, you know uh, achieved as often as is possible, mm -hmm. um, and they need to do those things mm -hmm. where they are calling up patients, telling them, come mm -hmm. back to us, we want to see you, mm -hmm. making those phone calls mm -hmm. um, together, you know, setting up those services, mm -hmm. seeing those patients. And, it, and when you see them at, in the office or talking to them on the phone, really focusing on a few key issues. You know, mm -hmm. one is, are you able to carry out that post-discharge care plan? Are, mm -hmm. you, are you ready, willing, and able? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have the mm -hmm. knowledge, skills, and attitudes to carry mm -hmm. out that, that mm -hmm. care plan? Um, are you even able to carry out your activities of daily living? Mm -hmm. And if not, do you have family members or caregivers who are mm -hmm. able to carry out those, mm -hmm. those activities for you? Um, all the medication management issues. Do you know what you're supposed to be on? How is it different than what you came in on? Did you get them and are you prepared to take them? Are you mm -hmm. able to take them? Um, dealing with all those issues. Mm -hmm. Red flags, do you know what to watch out for? When should you call for an ambulance? Mm -hmm. When should you uh, 
call us in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, your follow-up appointments. Mm -hmm. Do you know when they are? Do you know why you're having them? Are you, again, ready, willing, and able to actually mm -hmm. keep those appointments? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can start that conversation in the hospital, but it needs to continue after they leave. Mm -hmm. We can do some motivational interviewing in the hospital, mm -hmm. but frankly, patients are pretty overwhelmed mm -hmm. when we uh, discharge them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, a, there's an inherent limit to how much education we can do mm -hmm. in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mean we can't try. Mm -hmm. We should at least orient them to where all the information is. Mm -hmm. And we should focus on things like red flags, uh, the fact mm -hmm. that they should pick up their prescriptions on the way home if we don't mm -hmm. give them to them you know, in their right. hands before they leave. Mm -hmm. But that's not the time for complex coaching. Mm -hmm. They really need it in the outpatient setting. And frankly, I think a lot of it should happen at home. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we know whatever home-based services we can provide, mm -hmm. patients are in their environment where they're gonna be carrying out these activities. They're motivated, they have the mm -hmm. time, they're mm -hmm. relaxed. And that's where I think a lot of the education really mm. needs to come. And every time anybody does some of these interventions, first thing they do is they take all the pill bottles off the shelves and, and realize yeah. that these patients are taking who knows what. Mm. And, um, but then they really start talking about these issues, about mm. uh, you know, ev everything they need to do to, to take care of themselves. Again, if we're mm. going to be coaching, I think it's the best place to do the coaching. Mm. Um, you know, when I think about what is and isn't relevant uh, of all this work mm. to other countries, mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think what's hard about a transition is going to be hard about a transition anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. asking a, a patient and their caregivers to sort of take on uh, these mm -hmm. different responsibilities. I think what might differ are a few other mm -hmm. things. First of all, uh, length of stay, I think, varies mm -hmm. widely depending mm -hmm. on the healthcare system where we are. We're on the short end of that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I talk to colleagues, even in just Western Europe, I mean, they might have yeah. a length of stay twice as long. I think that's probably true in a lot of, of, yeah. of other parts of the world mm -hmm. as well. So patients, on the one hand, may be feeling a little bit better mm -hmm. when, they le when they leave, mm -hmm. and maybe their disease mm -hmm. is a little bit further along, but the transition is still tricky. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, uh, the uh, ability and willingness of families mm -hmm. to step up mm. and play the role of caregivers. Again, it's very different, I think, country to country, culture to mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, wherever you are, we need mm -hmm. to be taking full advantage of mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but it is gonna be different in different mm -hmm. places. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I think in the United States, we have a lot of skilled nursing facilities, subacute mm -hmm. care facilities. Mm -hmm. A lot of other places may not have as an option mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. uh, places for patients to go. Mm -hmm. And so you know, that issue may be mm -hmm. a, little bit, a little bit less relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and there are probably a, a bunch of other mm -hmm. issues just related to the technology and the acuity mm -hmm. of the care mm -hmm. and uh, willingness to, to deal with end-of-life issues, again, mm -hmm. very different from yeah. culture to culture, mm -hmm. you know, which may or may not be an issue mm -hmm. in a certain place. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think if we think about these various components of mm -hmm. a good transition of care, um, mm -hmm. we'll find some universal truths. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then you start talking about resource issues. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't think of a better place to spend resources where it's just mm -hmm. such, such a clear win-win, where the patients do better and we spend less money mm -hmm. uh, you know, down the line um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we can get these systems mm -hmm. in place and talking to each other more. Um, I guess you know, we're very siloed. Some other places mm -hmm. may be less siloed, mm -hmm. um, but, but you still have to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, this has been huge. I think of um, how Mike Porter defines value as health outcome over cost. And right. all the interventions you mentioned would be value generating activities right. in the transition of care. And our practitioners across the globe are trying to figure which ones do I select, which of those right. pillars across their bridge, right. which will be different. Right. But having your research to help guide them, you know, we, these are the pillars I should begin to suggest, right. and that transition will be just a huge form of knowledge for them moving I ahead. So. I hope so. And you know, we have a little bit of data. I, I was part of this home run consortium. It was yeah. um, uh, 12 different hospitals, and we each uh, looked at 100 readmissions each. Hmm. And we interviewed the patients, um, and then we interviewed their PCPs, and their docs right. took care of them the first time, and the docs took care right. of them the second time. Right. And, and we're doing this now in our, in our current PCORI funded right. study as well. But we already have the results of that one back. And a lot of it was trying to figure out, were these readmissions preventable, and how mm -hmm. they could have been prevented? And we did ask the questions through this lens of these different components. Mm -hmm. And what we found was about 30% or so of the readmissions could be deemed preventable, even with a fairly utopian mm -hmm. view mm -hmm. of how our healthcare system could be better. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not obliterating every social problem, mm -hmm. but we, we did say we have a functioning healthcare system where almost anything that adds value mm -hmm. could be in place. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, the, the pillars that are standing out in that work so far mm -hmm. are one, is this patient self-management piece. Mm -hmm. So this ability of patients to manage their symptoms, recognize their symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And the other is the monitoring piece. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that patients mm -hmm. may not be aware 
that something is going wrong, you have to have monitoring in place mm. to catch those mm. things, whether it's checking a mm. creatinine to look for you know, deterioration of renal function or checking mm. their weights, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, we need to have mm. those things in place. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of the others you know, played out as well. But remember, all that work is inherently mm. um, contrary to fact supposition. You know, a bad <laughs> outcome yeah. happened. Would yeah. this have prevented that bad outcome mm -hmm. from happening? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm hoping with an interventional study like we're doing now, mm -hmm. we'll have a lot more data mm -hmm. to sort of help guide us mm -hmm. on, on what seems to matter the most. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we need to do some broader studies. You know, we'll mm -hmm. make sure this is generalizable mm -hmm. to places beyond mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we work. So, so we'll see. Mm. So more, more information hopefully yes. coming from, for, uh, to help us all. Excellent. So. Well, Jeff, I feel like I have three M's for you that you're going to, I hope, um, summarize what, you, what you've shared with us. So how do we motivate, manage, and monitor this interaction mm. between patients and, our, and, us, and us providers? And I'm hoping some of our users on GHA Online can serve as those study sites as you expand and try and generalize your work. If we had to expect, if people are looking, to, when is Schnipper going to publish on this? Sure. What should we expect? Let's see. So in 2015. Um, the intervention ends in August of 2015, mm -hmm. and then it's going to take us, you know, six months to a year to get all those publications mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. I would think, and um, we're going to have a set of publications. You know, mm -hmm. I think one will be, you know, just the pure quantitative work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of them is going to be uh, this mixed methods qualitative mm -hmm. work on what were the barriers and mm -hmm. the facilitators of implementation. Mm -hmm across mm -hmm. our practices, mm -hmm. across our services, across mm -hmm. our hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm guessing there'll be some other spin-off papers as mm -hmm. well, where maybe we get into these mm -hmm. issues of, you know, which components seem to matter the most, mm -hmm. um, some case studies, mm -hmm. um, you know, some hopefully some really concrete um, mm -hmm. practical stuff that we, can, mm -hmm. that we can release. So I would expect by summer 2000, 16, mm -hmm. I guess is what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, these results should be back. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in the meantime, we'll be presenting mm -hmm. and, uh, and getting the word out in more informal settings. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jeff, so much for your time. Becca, I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. Really